Well, good morning. My name is Tracy Wilmstein. I'm a part of Plant Lab, and um, we just want to start off by saying uh, Plant Lab is funded by Ministry of Culture and Heritage, and this workshop is funded by Zoom webinars. So thank you to both of those organizations. And um, I'm going to start a little bit of my background, just a bit, to give you some context, and then look at the questions that I've been asking in my research for Plant Lab, and then what I've learned so far, and what I'm doing, going to plan to do next. Yeah, and and um, so let's dive into it. So my background, going back to um, my first interest, you know, where what I was going to be when I grew up was going to be a marine zoologist specializing in cetaceans and their communication, so whales and dolphins and and their linguistic things. So life happened, didn't end up doing that, and. Um, several different careers along the way have given me some amazing scope of background. About 20 years ago, I came back to um, art and creativity as my career. So that's been my, my main focus for, um, for a while now, just getting back into my own practice after having had a gallery and retail art store um, for about seven years. So it's um, my life tends to do this spiral thing, which is really interesting because that's a, a a major theme in my work and I've been learning that's actually a, uh, uh, a metaphor or a, a structure of how my creative practice works as my thinking spirals as well and um, and I find that really lovely because some of the images that appeal to me most are spirals and diamonds which you can probably see in those artworks just behind me which we'll talk more about later and that relates right back to like my ancient ancient ancestors are going back to um Scotland and the stones and they've got carvings in them of diamond shapes and lozenge, lozenges, that's diamond shapes, and spirals and they're working with lunar cycles and solar cycles and so it's fascinating that's my current practice. So that's enough about me for the background. My, um, my big questions in all my art research and, um, and there's always that biology science sort of awareness to my, my thinking. But um, it's like, how can I make a positive difference in our ecosystems, in our personal health, in the Earth's health, you know, looking at regeneration and raising awareness and making it in an inspiring way so people want to take action and, and so we all can upgrade, level up our, our actions for the well-being of our planet and ourselves. So that's a big driver for me. And it's like, how can I bring the wonder of nature to people who might be feeling disconnected from it or might not have had experiences that I've been lucky enough to have? And um, so again, bringing in inspiration, light forms, the, the amazingness of nature and then the connectedness of everything. So those are sort of my big ongoing questions always. Um, coming into Plant Lab, it was like, okay, plant, the plant's world. Um, is our theme. So how do I relate to that? And and for me specifically, what I, I took on, what is, what's going on for me at the moment? I've just moved to a new piece of land um, new to us. It's, um, it's recent, like as the last 200 years history or 150 years probably, is um, it's been, been a dairy farm. And so we're hoping to regenerate some of those areas of the dairy farm that have been treeless for a long time and regenerate um, you know some native forest and some riparian planting and so there's that theme going on for me and then where's my favorite place in the world always if I want to go into my happy place I imagine I'm swimming in the ocean either on the surface or just that first few meters underneath I love diving in being totally immersed in the water it's like my happy place um, so those to locations then informed like, okay, how am I gonna focus? Because the plant world is huge. Where do I start? So on our land, we were scraping away the topsoil to make a building site. And the digger driver's like, look, here's some curry gum. And he handed it to me and I was like, it's the ancient curry gum. It's the, it's the old stuff that's hardened like for millennia, million, uh, thousands of years. And so that was like, really touched my heart. This, you know, used to be a curry forest, this land. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna segue into that. So one of the things I've been interested in is 
with Plant Lab is natural plant-based pigments because I'm a visual artist. I like to carve and I like to um, make images, either painting or printmaking. And so I started investigating curry gum because I, you know, I've been hearing for years that it, it has um, an ancient, in Teo Maori, an ancient use as, as a pigment and as a medicine. And so I started researching a bit more about that. And, um, and so if we just go to some of the local parks around Whangarei, all and on the ground, because kauri trees naturally um, lose their lower branches as they're growing. And some of them have incrustations or, or dollops of when the sap has oozed at different times. So this, here we go. This is some, um, some light colored kauri gum. Let's see if I can get that focusing. And that's like recent fallen in the last year. Um, so that's really interesting. And you know, when it's dripping down the bark, it leaves these white strips. So that's how we can recognize it. And it's, um, yeah, it's got so much going for it in terms of medicine and so on, but that's a whole nother, a whole nother workshop. We won't go there too far. But the stuff in the ground that's been there for a long, long, long time. So it's only five to 10 to 20 centimeters down in various parts. So it's still in the upper topsoil. And it just looks like a rock at first until you catch the light. And then, oh my goodness, it's glimmering and it's got this golden color. And so inside it, when you wash the dirt off, you get what um, has been the industry for, for a lot of European settlers in this area um, in the, in the 1800s century. So, <laughs> jingle jingles in the background there, I'm getting one that's really shiny, is this beautiful kauri gum that um, it was, it was not recognized at first what its value was, but then they found out it makes a wonderful lacquer and it became an industry basically mining for cowrie gum like gold. And it was shipped off to Europe and made into uh, lacquer for the furniture industry. So these are, are probably what would have been considered poor quality. It's quite crumbly on that side, but the hard stuff is um, you would melt it down. So being, um, being my science side of myself, oh, I'm going to step back. So I work spiral. Three ways of working for me basically is we call it metadata. So researching through reading other scientific research, so studying through other people's studies and, and finding patterns and summaries. And um, and then actually doing things. So the empirical, practical, hands-on, what happens if I do this and what happens if I do that? And then my art practice research. So you'll find as I talk, you'll notice I'm going back and forth, or they're, or they're not back and forth. It's, it's just they're all informing each other. And I'm, I find that that process inspires me. Um, so coming back to, I had read and heard that if you melt the curry gum, uh, if you light it, you light it and let it burn, its smoke is, um, is able to be captured on oil that traditionally would have been oil on, on big leaves. Um, I did try it on some leaves that I had, but they weren't very big and they didn't capture very much. So, so I made up a little, like a little burner, a little Bunsen burner, just, you know, thank goodness for um, the little cans that you can um, cut. And I, I made something that was safe so the heat could get out. So that is the curry gum residue that had burned completely. And you, you can probably get a sense of how it can be made into shellac. It, it has other ingredients added to it to be a shellac for furniture. But while my little lump is sitting on there and I lit it and then it's smoking. And so I'd lined, lined a little container with some oil and held it above the smoke to capture the soot. And so that soot in oil, it's getting close there, is my first attempt at, um, at Kauri ink, basically Kauri gum smoke pigment ink. And what I did was just, um, pardon me, getting off camera, um, experimented with my fingerprint to start with. So, you know, the first ones were too oily and they were pretty blotchy. And then I was refining it. It's like, how much do I get on there? And I got some pretty good fingerprints. I'm hoping that that's focusing well for you. But I mean, if you look up close, it's a good image of my fingerprint. So I thought, that's pretty amazing. Kari gum smoke. But look how much pigment I got from burning one small lump of kauri gum. 
not very much for a big project. <laughs> so it got really clear that, okay, this isn't going to be what I use for my, my big prints in Plant Lab, but it was such a good process to learn about. And I'm really looking forward to discovering more about it. And, um, and that's, you know, that's something for the future. An area we can go down. But, so in, in realizing also I experimented with the algae growing in the ditch in our, in our newly, um, newly excavated building site. And um, I couldn't make it give me a green pigment even though I know it's possible. I, so very clear, I need to not be trying to learn how to make pigments myself. Someone else has already mastered that. I can access and, and use their mastery. So I'm online researching different kinds of plant-based pigments. And oh my goodness, five to seven years ago, there's a company in Colorado, some young um, PhD graduates in molecular biology and chemistry were trying to figure out what to do with a spirulina plant production um, of byproducts, byproducts. And, and you know, it's going to the landfill. How can we make it not go to the landfill? Long story short, they've developed the first major difference in ink since the printing press inks were developed centuries ago. And so we've got now just, just arrived this week, um, this last week from America, from Colorado, screen printing ink and offset printing ink, which is used in like printing a newspaper or making a, an art print on a press. And I'm so looking forward to experimenting with them. So these are already being experimented with by really big companies. We're talking um, Adidas and, and major clothing, like, sorry, my, my mind's just gone blank with the names. doesn't matter. The major, major players in, in pigment use in terms of textiles, um, that it's also used in black plastics in rubber tires, you know, carbon black is, is um, several gigatons of use a year and it's like very high in the, in the, um, the trading, the trading, global trading. It's one of the top 300 things that is traded around the world. It's, it's a huge, huge business. That's what I'm trying to say. So Inc. having a new technology that isn't based on Petroleum. So carbon black has been what we've been using all this time. It's based on petroleum. It's um, it's a dirty process. It's carcinogenic to use. And it, you know we say even a plant based ink we you know, we call it by uh, compostable, but it's only because there's only a little bit of ink on it. Actually, the ink is not good for us and it's not good for the um, for the environment. Whereas the living ink is based on the byproducts of the spirulina thing. So we're saving tons from the landfill. It's carbon negative, it's non-toxic, it's um, renewable quickly and cleanly. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it is to use because it's, it's gonna be cutting edge. It's like, I think probably the future of anything you see that has a black color in it coming forward. So that was a really exciting discovery for me. And so coming back around to my art research now, I'm thinking I'd really like to try out some different inks and some different pigments. And how am I going to do that? And one really good way when you're not wanting to go digital, you want to stay handmade. And I'm a hand carver. Um, I've carved big stones, small stones. And I've done some woodblock printing, which is carving out your design in the wood. So like that's that's um, where it's been carved out there, and I'll show you a bigger version in a second. I thought if I make some woodblock prints, I can make several, and then I can experiment on the same image over and over again with different pigments. Okay, so that's that that's I've decided on a process that will be useful. It's like what's the subject matter? So I went back to my happy place in the ocean. What are the plants in the ocean? Okay, we've got seaweeds growing up in the bottom, but we've also got I discovered that the phytoplankton um, are one of our major oxygen producers, like over 50%, between 50 and 70% are the different percentages I was reading about of all the oxygen in the world. It's produced in the top few meters of the ocean. So we've got the forests, 
on the land and we've got the uh, the wetlands and we've got the ocean and I was like that was news to me I couldn't believe that it was news to me it anyway so creatures that are very small they are microscopic or just barely visible by eye but they make chains or they just um this is a micron a electron um microscope so 50 microns oh sorry get that in the right place this little creature they're tiny, but they make swarms in the ocean. And thank you, Google. Um, you know, you're Googling these things and it's bringing up these kinds of images that are NASA photos. So from the International Space Station, photos from space, and those different colors are the naturally forming colors of the swirls of these little creatures, which there's thousands of different kinds of them. That's just two examples. And they happen all over the world. So you can see different, um, different images here, they're starting to use like LIDAR technology and, and um, things like that to measure at the different, um, different meters, like below the surface, what kinds of reflection they're getting and that tells them what kind of species it is. It's very fascinating. So here I am in the ocean and blue green swirls, my happy place. And I, okay, that's my image. And also spirals comes right back to, we were already talking about spirals in our, my ancestral, um, you know, it, it pulls to me every time I see those things, it's come up in my art forms a lot throughout the years. And so taking my inspiration from the swirls in, the, in these photographs from space, but using what I know about what's possible in a woodcut, you can only go to a certain level of, of detail. You can't go, um, in certain directions with a woodcut, you you know, I could have you know taken a uh, taken these photos and had them laser cut, but I wanted to do the hand carving thing. So what we've got up here, let me just get in the right light. No, nope. no. Nope. What I'm going to do is bring this back. What we've got here is the actual woodcut that I did. So first, I'm drawing on an MDF board, and then I'm literally carving out all the areas that are not dark blue, I've carved out so that what's left is what's printed. And so the process of, of going into the question of what is flow and what does what does swirl look like? And then how does that work in, a, in an artistic way? In a woodcut print, you need a variety of, of dark and light areas and texture um, to make a good image, to make a, an art image. So it was combining the science and the technology and and the requirements of the art process that ended up with this image. And then I've made the first test prints, which you can see up on the wall behind me in a couple of different regular traditional inks, um, you know, in the blue green color and in the navy blue. And then I'm going to be experimenting on them with several different kinds of pigments. So I'm going to back up a step and hang on just before I get to where those, those experiments are going to go. One of the really fascinating things about phytoplankton, besides that they give us oxygen, they, um, you know, they eat sunlight and carbon dioxide, basically, and give us oxygen. It's just fantastic. And they sink the carbon out of that carbon di dioxide. They capture it. And when they fall to the ocean floor, that's... Um, that's the carbon sink of of our earth like before mankind got all industrial that's what was keeping our our atmosphere clean is all these trees and plants and creatures in the ocean um well creatures the plants in the ocean sinking the carbon out of the air for us so that we can breathe so it's just it's our terraforming force the the plant world but the other interesting really interesting thing about these phytoplankton they have a protein called luciferin, which luce is um, for light. And they do this thing called bioluminescence. And so bio is life, lumen is light, and the essence is like it's the doing of it or the, um, <clears throat> it's the vital aspect of it. So if you've ever been on a boat or on the seashore, on the beach, at night, at certain times, the atmosphere and the temperatures are all about to be, you know, in all the right combinations. But you can get like a blue glow in the water when the waves are lapping, or if there's something splashes in the water, it comes up turquoise. 
And that's these creatures, these little phytoplankton, only tiny, but in a swarm, they make a, a turquoise blue light. And that just, that's one of those wonder things. I just go, wow, how can I share that with people? Um, I did have the really fortunate experience um, having, oh, I'll go now, but um, having been out on some uh, a friend's yacht and it was the right time of summer or something. And we noticed that the waves were doing this, this glowing thing. And this friend said, let's go swimming. And I said, are you sure? You know, it's not like jellyfish. We're not going to get stung. He's like, no, 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 it's safe. And so these little strings of phytoplankton were like, they bumped on my skin like jelly, but they didn't hurt. And as you swam through the water, it's the, the disturbing of the um, like kinetic movement of the water that lights them up, that, that triggers their, their function to light up. And so that, that feature of these phytoplankton just, just lights me up. You know, I'm, I think that's so cool. I'm, I'm excited to share that. So making several kinds of prints so that I can explore how can we create a sense of light or, or an experience of lighting up with the images. So what I've got over here looks like a blank white sheet, but I've got a, um, a UV light on it. So we're trying to charge up some glow-in-the-dark paint. That's one print that was made with glow-in-the-dark paint. So we'll see if it's actually going to work. But also I started doing the, the palette of what happens with my fluoro effects paint, which are fluorescent paints and putting, um, putting them together. So we've got blue and then yellow and then all, all these beautiful, there we go, beautiful sea green colors. So I'm gonna be experimenting with those paints on some of these prints. That's one aspect so we can play with UV light and glow in the dark and things like that. That's one experiment. And then another experiment I've got in mind hopefully we're going to get done in the next two weeks when the workshops are all going, is uh, one, one thing I did just in recent years was have a painting where there was copper, uh, uh, you know, conductive copper spots within the painting that you could touch and it would, um, it would connect the circuit. If you touch the grounding spot and you touch these other spots, it connected the circuit to play music, which was on a program on the laptop, you know, hidden away. And so that idea came back to me. I was like, how can we make these paintings so that when you touch them, they light up from behind, like the bioluminescence in the water, but obviously on dry land, so we're not getting wet. So that's going to be an exciting experiment. We'll take, because it's fabric, we can have something shining through. We'll take strips of neon. We, I'm, I'm hoping I'm collaborating with a couple of my fellow plant lab people here. So that's the we. Um, the fabric will, will let the light show through. And I'll have conductive paint. So this is um, electric, electric paint. It's got, it's got elements in it that conduct the electricity. It's sensitive enough that when you, you touch those areas and you touch the ground, you make the circuit. Because our bodies have energy running through them. That's what um, acupuncture works on. It's been going for thousands of years. And um, so our Western science is catching up, kind of go, how does that work? We haven't got a nerve or a vein to dissect. It's hard to see that, except you can see the effect. So things like when you touch the two points and it lights up, you know that electricity has gone through you too, but not in a jolting way, just enough to connect the circuit. So I'm, I'm looking forward to playing with the conductive paint and the lights behind and making that so that when you touch it, it lights up by luminescence and then the, extending my comfort zone um, is getting into things like the daisy and arduinos and i found this little grasshopper kit so he's going to be kinetic when he gets all hooked up and then this little kit is um i mean they've got it to be a clock but it's using using potatoes as the battery and i'm just like plant power. I love it. Power plant. Um, so, you know, I've got my potatoes ready to go and we're going to hook up the battery to the potato. I'm going to see if that will power up the light behind the painting. So it's completely its own circuitry of plant lighting up um, electronics and technology to make this bioluminescent simulation it's not a bioluminescent effect but it's a simulation so that's some of the 
the things that I find really cool that I think have been so interesting to be learning about. There's a lot more. I've been, you know, just shortening up some of the things that were um, that I've learned so far just to, to fit into today's talk. But I just wanted to give a shout out too to some of the other people that we've got working in, in Plant Lab and what I'm hoping to um, be collaborating with them on because it's it's just one of the benefits of, of a plant lab type environment. And so thank you to Maggie, Dr. Maggie Buxton and Uppy World and, and just setting all this up because if you're off in your own little mad scientist, mad artist world by yourself, it can feel like maybe being just a little bit mad about these things and you know does it really matter or who's actually interested but for us to get together and we all come from different angles for us to get together and go oh did you know about this or what have you thought about trying that or should we try putting these things together and see what happens that's where some really interesting magical new stuff can happen so i'm really grateful for this environment and i'm looking forward to working with the different other practitioners we've got here in, um, and some of the areas I'm hoping to take this, I'm just going to check back to my notes because talking, talking, take a deep breath. Yeah. So some of the things I'm, I'm looking forward to, to moving into in the future with this is 3D printing. So like, let's take these little features and make um, 3D models of them. And then maybe there can be an installation or maybe we can make something like that little kinetic creature with the the electronics, that's one thing. Um, working more with that digital interface, we can do laser cut prints and laser cut boards. And there's a whole interesting thing there with the technology that's out there, digital projection. Um, you know, just imagine being in a swirling ocean effect without getting wet. Um, so yeah, focusing on flow and, and lit and lit with from within is gonna be some, some future future iterations of this research. And I think that's probably about everything I've got to share with you for today. I'm going to quickly just make sure I haven't forgotten something really, really important. But I think that's about it. And, um, and so, yeah, just get in touch with us on our Facebook page and things like that. And come and see us in the Strand when we're open next week on the 22nd of September and I look forward to sharing with you some more after we've done some more experiments. So thank you very much for joining me today and I'll look forward to where we go from here. Thanks. <laughs>